episode 22, Derek Hansen. Welcome to the Oxidative Potential Podcast, where we discuss all things sports science and performance. I'm your host, Matthew DeRoche, and with me is my fellow co-host, Phil Batterson. Enjoy. Good day, folks. On today's episode, we have Derek Hansen, sprint coach and speed consultant. Now, Derek has basically consulted with pretty much the who's who in the zoo um, for anyone having interest in going fast on the ground. Uh, you know, professional football teams, uh, you know, track teams, you name it. Uh, Derek's, you know, played a part in consulting with a lot of those groups. And one thing I really admire about Derek is he's, you know, one, very humble. Um, but two, he's also quite a good voice of reason when it comes to things like, I never hear Derek really getting over the top on any one thing. I also never hear him becoming a zealot in any one methodology or any one um, intervention. And he takes a fairly, um, you know, scientific approach to everything he does. You know, you hear him talk, he's like, you know, intervention, observe, analyze, um, you know, another intervention. Like, he's just, it's, what he does is, you know, kind of, what you hope to achieve when you get to, um, you know, 20, 30 years in the game where it's, there's no fat. Like when you hear him speak on intervening with an athlete or, you know, whether it's assessing and, and programming for an athlete, it's, it's, there's no fat on anything he says or does. And that takes a lot of experience to be able to do that, to kind of understand what this athlete needs or may need and being effective and efficient at doing that so in this episode we discuss a ton of different topics all being applicable to going fast moving fast and these things i think hold true to not just moving fast on the ground but i think a lot of the principles behind it apply to you know going fast and any different modality, whether that's cycling, whether that's swimming. Um, I think a lot of these things are kind of universal that um, Derek has kind of whittled down and discussed. So I hope you guys really take a lot from this episode. I took a lot and I also took a lot just from hearing him describe his process and his train of thought. Like, I think you can learn a ton from people just by listening to how they present what they're saying in the way they say it. So I, I really hope you guys enjoy this episode. I will leave all the links to Derek's website, his social media and whatnot in the show notes so you can check that stuff out there. And I hope you guys really enjoy this podcast. Um, yeah, so catch you later. Okay, so Derek, um, for people that don't know, I've, I've given you a slight introduction, so people should be familiar with, you know, where you're coming from, but um, I kind of found you through the, um, my introduction to the sprint world and trying to understand more about, you know, what inherently makes someone go faster than someone else. Um, you know, so I went down the whole Charlie Francis rabbit hole, um, you know, then I kind of broke into other people in, in the space as well, tried to understand what they were trying to put forth. Um, but it's interesting because I think, you know, a lot of the stuff I've, I've listened to you uh, on podcasts and, and some of the articles I've read um, from your stuff, it's, uh, I really like that you take like this non-zealot approach to anything and you've been around for a long time. So you've seen a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, like my hair's still dark. I still have hair yeah. and my hair's still dark. <laughs> but I am turning yeah. 53. So yeah. 53. Yeah. And that I mean, for for being in the sprinting world, looking at athletes, that's a long time. You kind of remind me of like um, you know, some of my Scandinavian friends. Like they've they've been around, they've seen a lot of stuff, and they have a lot of education and knowledge on a topic, but they're like, you know, they're not very like 
they're very conservative in what they say. And, um, and that's because they've, they've been burned probably quite a few times, but they also know that a lot of things are kind of too good to be true. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get a, an understanding of, uh, you know, how you, you kind of apprentice in this world of, of sprinting and speed and moving fast. Like where, where did you kind of start your journey at? Like, who are the, the big pillars in your education process and, and learning process? Yeah, Matthew, I would say, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot of things. It's a a culmination of a lot of things. And I was talking to somebody else about this and I think it, you know, one of the biggest impacts was that I had some natural degree of speed when I was a kid, you know, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't a world-class sprinter by any means, but I was, you know, when you go to school and you're the fastest kid in the school, and then you go to high school and you're the fastest kid in the high school, um, people notice and it has an impact on you. And I think sometimes it's not until you get older and you have your own kids that you mm-hmm. kind of realize, wow, wow, that's like a currency, mm-hmm. right? I was, I, I went to go watch my kids run track and we, they didn't, honestly, we didn't prepare them for track. They're doing other sports. I want them to try different things. So they weren't all year round track athletes, but they would still go out and do very well. And my son won his sort of city finals and and the one and the two and um and and i was telling somebody next to me i'm like i'm just used to going to watch my kids run and usually they win Mm -hmm. and and i don't think most people get that luxury of taking your kids and going to a track meet and going yeah there's a good chance they're going to win so i'm a bit spoiled but i understand how important that is for my kids to be part of any sport they're gonna they're going to be able to play a role and they're going to be contributing because they're fast. Um, and when you're a kid, it's, it's not necessarily uh, the same with strength. Like nobody's like, you know, when you're grade seven, nobody's going like, I can bench press this and I can, you know, deadlift that, yeah. but you know, when somebody's fast. And so you get picked for teams earlier. Um, the PE teacher likes you, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and I laughed at that too, but, it does, you know, my kids don't have any problems with, you know, being bullied at school. They're always picked for sport, you know, and and that may sound like sort of a, a sort of a stuffy sort of, you know, oh, this is, you know, we're fast and, you know, but Mm. there's a reality, right? And if you're not picked for sports and, and you don't get involved in sports and you're not heavily passionate about it, um, you know, and it helps if you've got some natural talent, Mm. it's going to affect your upbringing. I remember going to my, um, 30th high school reunion and uh, I think we had 450 people in our class and I think 40 people showed up you know and Mm -hmm. I asked the organizer I said well how come you know people don't want to come out to this you know it's 30 years it's nice to kind of see everybody says you know I talked to a lot of people and a lot of people did not have a good time in high school right Mm -hmm. and if you played sports and you're on you know you you probably had a pretty good time in high school because that was such a big part of it. it wasn't just going to class it was training it was getting ready for games going on a trip or something like that so that's had a huge impact on me um and how i view things whether i'm working with somebody else's kid whether i'm helping my own kids um and even educating my kids about how important it is to get involved and if you have kids and when you have kids to help with that you know and and they're going to have some natural talent but you got to help cultivate it as well so i think when i was a kid i was fast track track club and was always around people who, you know, kind of helped with that. Whether or not they were great coaches, we could debate that. For the most part, they were just out there with a stopwatch and encouraging people. Yeah. So that's huge in my development. And then when I got older, when I competed at uh, university level, and, and I did mostly long jump and triple jump, because those were the events that I could kind of keep moving up, you know, and go to national championships and potentially make a national team. Um, because I wasn't quite as fast as I needed to be. Having said that, now that I know what I know, I wasn't coached in the sprints properly. Nobody taught me how to, you know, go from acceleration to max velocity and transition and, mm-hmm. and how to work on certain things in training and why the drills are important. Um, so it's it's been very interesting for me, you know, 53 years later, kind of deconstruct everything that I've been through and why it's kind of driven me to be better as a sprint coach. And then again, as a father, um, 
And, you know, I think that's what's kind of driven me. I, I, I felt like I had some ability, probably wasn't coached as well as I could have been anywhere near. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I meet somebody like Charlie Francis, you know, and that's somebody you watched in the eighties and you admired him. They'd come out and run track meets out in Vancouver. Um, and I went, I remember going to a lecture when I was like 16 or 17 and he was talking about his training process. Um, and that was, you know, it, he made it simple but it sounded like he really knew what he was talking about and that had an impact. And then eventually got together with him in around 2000, 2001 and started working with him. And then you're like, Oh, okay. This is what track, you know, sprinting is all about. And this is how you train. And this is, but until then I I didn't really get all of that, you know, in terms of, you know, that high level of thinking, the organization, how to look at somebody and analyze how they run and, and how to deconstruct things and, and put it all back together and go, okay, mm-hmm. you know, I had, I had some experience as, as an athlete and there were some good things that we did, but it all came together probably by the time it was too late for me to take advantage of it for myself. Mm-hmm. There's a, <clears throat> there's a few things I noticed in what you said there. Uh, first, when you're talking about your kids and that speed being a currency, it's funny, but I don't think it's talked about enough. There was a pop sci author. I can't remember his name. It was one, one of the popular guys out there, but I remember reading some of the research that was done on essentially success in terms of monetary success and, and placing in corporate management, all these different things and positions held and the relation to not the education those individuals had. So not Ivy league schools, essentially but the percentile in which they place in the education that they had. So the, the biggest uh, basically factor that was all encompassing for success was did that individual stand out within their, their peers, right? Were they in the 96th percentile instead of just going to Harvard? Cause if you're an outstanding student and wherever you are in Canada or, or, or United States, you know, you're sitting in, let's just say the 98th percentile of your high school, then you go to Harvard. Well, it's probably not going to be the 98th percentile anymore. Now you're maybe in the 70th percentile, 65th, maybe 50th. And that affects your, your place and in, in your confidence, everything yeah, around your perception you. of yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. then another thing I noticed that you said too, was um, like, you're, you're talking about the process that you're reflecting on coming up. And I think that's one thing I noticed between like any good coach out there is not just that they went and had experience in sport, that they're bad or good, but they're extremely reflective on what was, what, what, what was the reasons that caused them to either not progress or stagnate or whatever it is that didn't ultimately lead them to success where they wanted to be. And the deeper the reflection on that, you know, generally the more answers you're going to get, but, um yeah Char- let, let's get into charlie francis because that was a huge uh eye opener for me it was this guy that came out there you know really cared about his athletes was really objective and mm. how he viewed things right like when he's talking about methodologies one thing i noticed was he was very objective and he wasn't a zealot about anything whether it was ems like uh, muscle stem or massage or chiropractor or fixing asymmetries or whatever it is weights he was just objective. Hey, it's good for some athletes. It's good for, for, for others, maybe not so for, for this guy. Um, so w- what other things did you learn from his process? Like you were talking about, you know, taking this bigger picture view, you know, what are some of the things that took you a while to kind of wrap your head around with, with learning from him? Yeah. Um, one, I think the biggest thing was that he kind of trusted what he saw and like you said, he didn't overreact. He wasn't reactionary in what he did. He has enough experience as an athlete, as a world-class athlete, and and, and obviously mm-hmm. as a coach, to go like, okay, you know, let's 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 just change this, or let's kind of keep going, and we'll see where it goes. I think one of the things he said was there were people criticizing Angela Taylor, Angela Sajenko, about oh she's overstriding, and he said, well, you know, she's young, she's not strong enough, she can't you know get the same ground reaction for us i'm not going to change her technique just you know let her run and see mm-hmm. where it goes and will when she gets stronger she'll be able to find those positions so he had this mm-hmm. 
patience about him that I, I think a lot of people don't have and, and sort of a humility around like, you know, who am I to say, or, um, I'm not going to fix it right now because I, I can't fix it. It doesn't have anything to do with anything within my control. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, like you said, there was this weird sort of, it was almost like a jazz, right. Where he was kind of just playing, you know, what he saw at the time and who was playing in his band and, um, working off of other people. And I think that was the hardest thing for me to kind of internalize because you're always asking, okay, what is the magical workout, right? Or what's the best exercise? And, and I, I know I helped them do seminars and things. And that those were the questions. Everybody wanted a definitive, how do I do it? Paint by numbers. And, and he was absolutely not of that type, right? He, uh, I think his dad was an artist and, um, you know, he, you know, he always said that he kind of was that right brain kind of person. So he, I remember we were trying to write a book and uh, we had all these diagrams and he said the easiest way for him to conceptualize it was to like put the diagrams on the ground and just visually see where everything goes. And, and it drove me nuts because, you know, I, you know, I, I think I, I, I always, you know, created sort of like a table of contents and an outline and it was a little more linear. And he's like just throwing stuff on the ground and just looking at the colors and stuff. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is going to take forever. Yeah. So there was a weird, the weird sort of something that, you know, it wasn't scientific, even though he mm -hmm. could, he could speak very scientifically. Um, and uh, it was, there was a flow to what he did that I, I just, can't, you know, there's no way I'm like that, but certainly I can pull from some of those things and I can, be a little more patient with something and see how it takes shape. And that's just kind of the way he was. So th that, those were kind of the interesting things. And like you said, when you see somebody run by, um, you know, he would always say to me, what do you think? I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know, like, I don't have anywhere near the experience of you. It looked really fast. Right. Um, he said, did you see, you know, you know, you know, how the heel came up on that side versus the other side. And, you know, and I'm like, no okay, you know and then you watch again and again and again and you're like oh okay i sort of and then 10 years after he's died you're like oh i yeah, wish i yeah. could ask him about that right yeah so yeah. and i remember people would come out to go you know all hang out with him and watch him coach and one guy was he asked me oh what you know what has your, been your experience i said there's so much stuff going on that I, it takes me years to kind of absorb and understand and even then i'm not sure he's like oh I was hoping I would, you know, be able to pick up a whole bunch in this two days I'm here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez. <laughs> so, and that's the, the stuff like that, I think is really important because there's this, the, the two things I learned from him was that you need a certain volume of work and you need a certain amount of time in order to build something and mm -hmm. build someone. And uh, I think people, especially nowadays, people don't have that patience to kind of work through a system and a process and figure mm -hmm. out your protocols and, and, and just be content with maybe you don't know it all. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you just have to figure it out. And then, you know, it's, it's just like talking to my kids who are teenagers and I'm saying like, you know, take your time, do this. You don't really know anything. Kind of listen to your parents. And they're like, screw you dad like i'm gonna figure it out myself but mm -hmm. we all know that as you get older things start to come together and you're like oh okay that's why that worked and that mm -hmm. and so i think the, anything i learned from him has been it's taking me time to kind of walk in his footsteps to some degree and go ah and have that aha moment later but I, I, and i think that's what education should be and learning mm -hmm. should be and i think that's the one thing that he imparted to me it's not about solving it right away and having the perfect workout it's 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 much more uh what's the word um you know it, it's just i hate to use the word um you know it's <laughs> i can't put my finger on it but it's yeah. it's just or it's a sort of organic process where you just like yeah. organic okay, epiphany. Like, yeah, yeah 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 and 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 i think that's missing today yeah. so yeah. That was uh yeah like that that's super enlightening when when you talk about that like being where where you are at now like that was something actually I I kind of asked you know Bill Hartman when I was trying to understand certain things 
And I'm like, what, you know, what am I, what am I looking at here? What should I be looking at? Because I, you know, I can't understand these things. You know, what are the things I should be looking at that I'm not going to understand, you know, 15 until 15 years from now, you know, what, what is it that I should be trying to peel my eyes open for? And you gave me a good answer. It's like, you know, just pick things. Like there's a lot, there's already enough out there. Just settle on something and that will inherently make it the best possible thing for you. Cause I could give you something, you know, but inherently it, it the value in it is not, it's zero. You're going to figure out all these things, regardless of what they are just by sticking to it and going through the process. And I heard another, I just listened to a podcast with, with Joel and, and um, I can't remember the name of the guest. I'm sorry for getting his name, but he was talking about a famous throws coach might've been Bonner Chuck. Mm-hmm. I think it might've been Bonner Chuck not sure but he was just like he kept just drilling the same thing over just like yeah do this you know do this and it was a, it was appropriately coached and appropriately placed but it reminds me of people like yeah just hit 170 until we hit 170 cadence you know we're not going to have a discussion here and then the athlete has to go through this rebirth and death of this what does 170 mean and they find 170 but they find it in different ways right they find it and it becomes mm-hmm. a new thing every time they hit it And I think there's like something inherently really powerful about that process of, you know, death and rebirth, death and rebirth and trying to find, um, you know, these things again. Um, But yeah, one thing I'd really like to get your take on is, I mean, you've been around so many different organizations and, and processes of trying to like get people faster. Like what, what are like, what are some of the common things you see out there where sprinting is maybe, hold a lot of misapplication like what 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 do you see the common grasp for sprinting being in the wrong wrong context you know what i mean like whether it's just a specific sport or just certain things people are trying to aim for what what do you what do you see yeah um i think the one thing that i always see is is that people like to talk about sprinting and getting faster and what drill and oh you know is um you know, is their shin angled this? And is there, you know, all of these very minute details. And I think you just, a lot of the time, you just need to get out there and you need to put in the work. And it sounds very generic, right? But you need to put in a certain amount of volume. Um, You need to, like in track and field, you need to put in a certain number of races too, because racing is different than training. Um, It's an entirely different vibe. The muscle tension can be different and and just managing your emotions is really different, uh, mm-hmm. much like you need to play games um, in sports. So I think um, when people say like, how do I get faster? I'm like, well, you got to do it regularly and you have to do it for an extended period of time. So the NFL off season is like essentially five week training camp, right? Mm-hmm. And there's not much you can do in five weeks, especially mm-hmm. when they only give you two times per week, half an hour to work on speed. Yeah. And, and and so I I start saying to teams, I'm like, okay, so you got five weeks, you know, whatever, four times a, a week, you know, maybe two hours you have. I don't know what they, you know, it varies by team mm-hmm. for strength and conditioning. And they're trying to get everything into two hours per day and and like, oh, we got to do some core strength. We got to do some plyos. We got to do some agility. We got, and, and why don't you just, like you said, focus on maybe two or three things and let's get really good at them. Because if we just focus on all these things, we dilute it. Um, we don't have enough volume of any of these qualities. And then we get four weeks off before preseason. And if nobody does anything, it's all going to disappear anyways. Mm-hmm. And so this idea that let's work on that one simple thing and let's repeat it. Let's repeat it. Let's repeat it. Nobody wants to do that. That's the most insecure uh, reaction I I get is like, well, what about this? And what about agility? And what, you know, agility seems to be the huge one for some Mm -hmm. reason, everybody's insecure. Like we're not doing enough agility, Mm -hmm. uh, even though whatever they do looks nothing like what happens on the field. Um, So I, you know, if you would, you know, if you were just to, because some of the throwers I that were very good that I, you know, trained with us, um, they would go in, they would do one pull in the weight room, they might do one squat or one, like three exercises, mm. and then they would leave, mm. right? Otherwise, they're throwing, working on technique and all that. They're, mm. They don't have, you know, if you go to a division one, you know, strength and conditioning program, 
you know, the workout card is like this and the yeah. font's like a six point font. And you're like, yeah. how do you get through this? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how does anybody, anybody get better at anything? Yeah. And so though, that's the thing I think with the sprinting is nobody wants to dedicate the time and they never give enough, you know, you know, length of time and, and enough time in a session. And, and then when they do it, like they're pulling sleds, they're you know doing this, running up hills, running over wickets, whatever, like just fucking run. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so that's what kills me, I think, is that why don't we just manipulate, you know, like you were alluding to is like, let's manipulate recovery times, let's manipulate intensities, let's manipulate volumes, and let's kind of play with a couple of variables and just try to maximize what we can out of that. Mm -hmm. And I find that's not happening. It's going the other way. It's like, let's throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah, there's, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, oh man, I, I swear I bring up Louis Simmons in almost every other podcast, but it, it, I learned a great deal from Louis Simmons, but that whole conjugate style of thinking of we need to keep every stimulus on at every specific time. I mean, you know, there's something to be said about that when maybe you're trying, you're trying to expose the child to as many different, you know, the situations and experiences as possible. They need to build this library of experience and movement right makes sure. sense um but when we're talking about trying to hone in on specific variables um and qualities yeah it's like i i think there's something lost there and trying to put my finger on it like one thing i've pavel satseline and dan john two guys i learned a great deal from and whenever i first came across them you know i was like ah not no, no, no. I was like, I was thinking I was like maybe 14, 15. I'm like, no, nah, this is way too boring. I'm not reading this stuff. This is, I, I, you know, there's nothing these guys have to offer. Obviously I was really young, immature, and I was just looking for something that I didn't quite understand. I thought that was going to be the answer. Then when I resurfaced back to that, when I was like 18, 19, I was like, oh, wow, this stuff really makes a lot of sense. You know, doing, I remember what Jan, Dan John is easy strength, like doing the same movements over every day at a sub maximal load and strength is a skill greasing the groove all these things started to like click in my head and being like oh wow yeah strength is a skill speed is a skill it's coordination the more efficiently i can apply these motor units to whatever i'm doing the stronger i can be the clearer that signal is coming down from the motor cortex right all these things started to make sense in my head now i'm like oh wow there's something to be said about you know doing your work every day, packing your lunch and going out and getting into the practice. Um, that kind of brings up one thing in my head is uh, like micro exposures or micro dosing as they call it, you know, um, you know, do you, do you, do you find good use in that? Cause I seem to have found a lot of really applicable sit situations where exposing to the athlete, in these kind of micro exposures every day over a period of time. And you get these measurements, you know, along with it too, you're getting to see how they shift and how they respond each time. Do you, do you find good use in that? Cause I've heard you speak on it before. I'm just interested yeah. in your thoughts on where yeah, you're at. I think that. it's very useful. And, and, uh, if you're doing it right. And so that is, would be, you know, the, I, I experimented on my interns years ago when I was working at university and, um, we had people do, you know, different programs. Okay. You're going to do just, uh, power cleans and variations every day, <laughs> mm. like six days a week. And mm. we're going to have a, maybe a submaximal day and a more maximal day and just kind of go back and forth between them and, and keep it very simple. Mm. Um, and then we had, um, you know, somebody maybe do it as a sprint or somebody do just a squat. And we just experimented with that. And we found that, it was tougher for them mentally to do it because mm. of that repetition of a very dry thing. Right. And they're mm -hmm. used to, you know, part of going to the gym is you get to try this exercise in this machine and go hang out over here where the girls are or whatever. Yeah. And, and so that was the toughest part, but physiologically they all improved very significantly. Um, but the problem with that scenario or that model is it doesn't fit into the schedule of the day or your life or, you know, uh, I have football practice or I have soccer practice, you can't necessarily implement that practically because yeah. of schedules, right? Yeah. So, uh, but it does work really well. And the reason I found it worked really well is because I would be doing uh, rehabilitation 
with athletes and they couldn't practice. So every day they would work with me on short sprints or some quality. And when they were reinserted back into uh, practice and games, they were uh, had uh, tremendous abilities. They were better than everybody else because everybody else was doing practice, which was essentially rehearsing stuff that wasn't that fast or that you know strong or whatever. And it was uh, they were essentially detraining on the field. Mm, um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that yeah, that was pretty interesting. So I, I you know, and I understand there's value in practicing and rehearsing and looking at tactical things, but I think mm. the sport coaches have just totally dominated that. And like, you know, in some of the NFL teams that I've worked with, you'll hear things like, well, we have 300 plays, but in a game, we probably use about 20 of those, mm -hmm. but we practice all of these all the time, just because, you know, in the Super Bowl, we use that one play once, right? Mm -hmm. And we only hear about when there's a success. So they like pull that trick play <laughs> out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and oh, yes, that's the reason we won, because we practice that, that play hundreds of times in the last three years and you're like well what about the other ones that you threw in and they blew up in your face we never hear about those so i think there's this heavy emphasis on practice and and tactical and, and i'm not saying it's not important but you know i think things could be more evenly divided amongst all of the the variables and needs of the athlete to uh, maintain qualities and keep them healthy so i i think there's value in that microdosing approach it's just what ends up happening is people go like, well, we only got 10 minutes, you know, cause I work for a major league baseball. And so we're going to microdose, we're going to do two sprints. And then the, you know, the volume just isn't high enough yeah. uh, to really get an effect. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, a charade, right? It's just not, it's not really having an effect, but everybody feels like they're doing something and they throw out the term microdosing. So I think there has to be a huge commitment to doing it the right way. And, yeah. and that's difficult. Yeah, it just it's funny. I just ended up having a conversation right before this with John Kiley, and we were talking about um, you know slow movements and stuff like that. I brought up Jay Schroeder, and I mean I know he's controversial and all this stuff, but one thing I really found interesting was you know the program's the program. You know we're all doing the same thing in here, and people you know I listen to people talk about you know going in the gym and just being surprised that they were doing basically the same thing that these NFL athletes were doing. You know, just the intensity, obviously they could dig much deeper into the system than, you know, these people are beginning, but it was very interesting that, you know, we're just going to expose you to this day after day and, you know, your ability, okay, are you perfect at this, you know, isometric split or whatever, Russian lunge, you know, any of these movements you have been far from perfecting, right? So why are we going to stop if we're continuing to gain progress and you're continuing to improve, Right. And that brings up another person that I've, I've talked about on the podcast before, but which was, um, oh, Niels Vanderpool, the speed skater from um, uh, Sweden, I believe. Um, and, you know, he went out and did this crazy, I mean, it's not crazy. A lot of the athletes do these high volume things, but he just went out there and did like 15 months of like 30 to 35 hour weeks of the same thing on the bike, the same wattage, you know, the same things. And in a way, it's similar to microdosing in my mind, because he's just doing the same thing over. And people say, oh, yeah, if the stimulus isn't varied, you're, oh, you're going to plot. And I mean, well, he continued to improve. And not only that, because he was doing the same thing over and over again, his ability to detect shifts out of homeostasis was much higher. And also, because the route or the program is the same, he's also having these tests, Right every day there it's a test because it's the same as the thing next week so this serves as a test and what he became very familiar with was you know what are my lactate levels at this what is my heart rate level at this on monday if i notice it's you know this compared to this that's a big shift than i'm normally used to so something's off it's a huge red flag um so yeah, when you talk about implementing things properly i think there's something to be said for like you know what are you trying to do specifically? Is this adequate? And are you carrying in dogma? Because someone said six weeks is, you know, all you're going to get out of it. Um, yeah, I just I think that's very insightful listening to you talk about that. Um, yeah, because as a kid, like, uh, my mom's uh, Chinese. So mm -hmm. I'd have relatives come into town and we go to watch kung fu movies like in the <laughs> 70s, right? Yeah. And uh, there was always every there was always a double bill, double feature, and there would always be one about like 
some Shaolin temple monk yeah. scenario, right? So yeah. I remember there was one where um, I, I can't remember what it was like the 12 chambers of the Shaolin temple and, and each one of them had a master. You know, mm. this was the kicking guy. This was the nunchuck guy or whatever. <laughs> and, and that's all they were good at. But, you know, it was that sort of thing, that idea that like you're going to master your trade and you're going to just do this until you know, it's, you know, it's an, it's a hindbrain reflexive thing. And you just, you know, you can defeat anybody, even though it's the singular uh, activity that you're learning, right? Like the whole 10,000 kicks is better yeah. than, yeah, the Bruce yeah. Lee quote, right? So I, I think that kind of resonates with me is that we can always continue to be better um, in this singular act or activity. Um, and like you said, there's this sort of awareness that, this hyper awareness now of any variation mm -hmm. um, that, that I think people are lacking, right. You know, it's, mm. it's when you go on the Netflix, you know, 30 years ago, if I went on a Netflix, I'm like, Oh my God, look at all this entertainment. <laughs> now I look at Netflix. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, most of this is crap. And I don't yeah. know what I, I, you know, they didn't really grab my attention in the first episode. So screw that. I'm not going to, you know, so it's kind of dulled our senses, I think. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a good point to make on dulling the senses is <clears throat> there's so much over stimulus for a lot of people. And like, there's actually no stimulus whatsoever, right? Like, that's how socially, that's how social media makes its money, right? That's how these these systems work. They're meant to work in, in that manner. Um, one thing I'd be interested to to hear you kind of go off on is, you know, these archetypes of things we see now, they're not clearly defined in the literature people are going to be like oh there's no literature to support that these you know there's these elastic kind of components to certain people and there's more of a muscular um, bias towards these other people to accomplish a goal um but is that something that you found that you know you, you see these kind of differing archetypes and if you have like have you approached them you know incorrectly at times like have you have you come across like applying a certain type of of loader stimulus to some of that it might not have been appropriate for or do you think that's more so like maybe just a kind of system that people carry into like do you think it's 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 valid in any in any way have you seen it in practice be that you know this might not be beneficial yeah i think it's just I, it's it's like anything it's just you kind of come into into a a scenario and you kind of go okay um, this is how I organize my thoughts. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's this, this, and this, and it's like a starting point, but it's definitely not, you're not limited. To, I think at least for me, mm -hmm. I might have that sort of archetype, like, okay, this is like the short stocky guy and he has high frequency and this is the longer legged mm -hmm. guy. And, you know, and you kind of look at people and then they surprise you. Right. But I think mm -hmm. all that stuff is, is it just, it's, it gives you a starting point in which to organize your thoughts and then you can start moving people around um, and, and it may change on a daily basis, a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is, it is valid in that it helps you organize your thoughts and maybe give you, okay, something to work with initially. Right. And mm -hmm. just like uh, you could say that some sort of movement screen isn't valid, but it's something it's like yeah. a contextual yeah, yeah. beginning. Right. So, yeah. okay. Step over that hurdle. Oh, you suck at that. Yeah. So, you know, you draw your conclusions and then you come up with a training plan and then you may find out a week later that you guess wrong and you know whatever i mean i think everybody again going back to everybody wants that cookie cutter approach and i'm going to just nail this and i'm going to be a i'm going to be a star and it's you know anybody who's has experience knows that it doesn't work that way yeah. you know you can have your you can have your preconceived ideas but just be you know be prepared to kind of you know shake the etch a sketch right and start over again yeah yeah that's something that's like uh yeah i've learned that kind of i you know where i first came across this it wasn't actually in the physical qualities it was in the neurological qualities so like mm -hmm. i remember reading some russian research on training um you know athletes in a different manner based on their neurological profile and then that turned into stuff that i heard uh the late uh, uh charles parliquin talk talk about and then that was like you know eric braverman the the test for you know neuro neurotransmitters and now um christian thibodeau right so neurotyping and it, it was funny because i was like oh yeah this stuff makes a lot of sense and you know the gaba deficient and 
um, you know, individual likes, you know, sometimes less variation and they kind of do better. And I realized, okay, yeah, this is, it's, it's, it's actually fairly useful to use as a starting point. Yes. Because depending on the personality of the individual, you know, there are going to be inherent things that they just don't like or do like or yeah. more. And it, and I found it to be actually quite useful. And even though there's, you know, very little science because we can't test neurotransmitters to a high degree at this point in time, but mm -hmm. I found it very useful, you know, and some athletes, they, you know, because of their, you know, psychological traits, they are much easier to, Hey, I can give you this same program. We can actually be patient with it a little bit longer. Like you were talking about patients. Yes. We can, we can expose them to it a little bit longer just to see, Hey, can we actually eke out something where other athletes it's like, if it's not working, oh, I don't, I don't want to do it. And you can't show them any, you can, you can only show them a little bit of doubt. Like when, anytime you start talking about doubt, I was talking with Andre Feldman about this. It's like, it puts a lot of fear and a lot of mistrust into them. Right. Yes. And that essentially affects the relationship and their belief. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, when you're talking about archetypes there, it is, it's a useful it's like a, starting. It's point. a narrative, right? Like it's kind of yeah. a narrative where you can kind of, have a conversation with people and yeah like you said build confidence and trust yeah. and all yeah and I, i've heard you talk about this too because you go into the worst situation i don't mean like you know but you go into these teams where it's very cutthroat right like you you literally have people that i just despise you without even knowing you because yeah. they're going to be held accountable now to some of the practices that they're putting forth um yeah and you're just an hard. external person that they may think doesn't really have a stake in it. Like, Hey, you're going to waltz in and you're going to take off and I'm still stuck here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, so there's huge animosity um, because it's just human nature, right? Is mm -hmm. if you understand human nature and, and, you know, you have to, you have to walk into that scenario and go, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm just here to help. Like, you know, you guys are doing a great job and mm -hmm. you may say that even though they're doing a shitty job. Right. Mm -hmm. But you're trying to, bring people on side um, and get them to look at your point of view and make this a meaningful interaction as opposed to you guys suck and you should just do what I do. And then as soon as you leave, guess what they're going to do? They're not going to do what you did, right? Or told them to do. So um, yeah, it's a real, there's a real soft art behind all of this that I think we don't talk a lot about um, and, and probably we should be spending more time talking about it because I think like you said, you don't know, like I, I could propose something and it could just really work well for some reason, but it's almost like horoscopes, right? Like, <laughs> you know, you know, you're reading like, oh, look, it's, I'm going to have a profound thing happen to me today. Right. And then mm -hmm. something happens. You're like, it was right. right? <laughs> but it's just yeah. coincidence. Right. It's yeah. not that, you know, there's any magic behind it. I think and, and sometimes that happens. I'll go into a pro sport team and I'll say, this is what we have to focus on. Like, let's say it's the Kansas City Chiefs. Like, we should focus on speed. And then they magically acquire Tyreek Hill, right? Mm. And, you know, and yeah. I'm not going to take credit for that dude, right? Yeah. But they, yeah. And they look fast. They're the fastest team. And they got this guy and this guy and this guy. And I could probably go out there and, you know, put an ad out and saying it's because of me. But it's coincidence, too. Yeah. Right? And they have a coach that took advantage of that. So, you know, I don't know. I, th I think you have to be very realistic about uh, what your impact can be and, 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 and try to build relationships. And then if you have a good relationship, that's going to endure longer than your sales pitch or your philosophy or your system. Right. So, mm -hmm. and that's what I found. Um, if, if you have good relationships and you make connections, that's going to, do more to create the next job for you or give you an opportunity to move up than it is if you go in there and you're an asshole and you are right. If you're, that's probably more damaging that you're an asshole. It doesn't matter if you're right, you know, mm. things can change in a hurry, but you know, that's, mm. that's, how, that's what you learn over time. Yeah. The, the trying to, to meet the needs uh, on a, you know, on a relationship level to everyone is it's a very hard, hard job, you know, to, yeah. to be that person to make change, make effective change. But, you know, I've seen it with leadership when, when I was in the military too, like, you know, to be a good leader and also have respect and also treat people properly. It's, it's a very, very fine balance to walk and very few people do it well. Um, but the people that do it well, they, 
you know, are inherently successful because of it. Yes. Um, uh, something else here, like I'm, I'm very interested to hear your take on, do you think there's good application for endurance athletes? So I'm talking, you know, 10 K up essentially in my mind for sprinting. Now, I, I think, I, I think there's been some good, um, you know, talk about, you know, what are some of the qualities that sprinting builds, but do you think there is, um, a place for sprinting, um, and endurance athletes, because uh, I have a lot of theories on this and stuff I've seen anecdotally, but, um, what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot of factors. So one would be, um, like I always do breakdowns of like the guy who, um, Kip Choj, who runs two hour marathon, mm -hmm. and, you know, if he's running four, what is it, four thirty six per mile for twenty six miles, mm -hmm. he could probably run one mile in under four minutes, probably pretty easily, right? So mm -hmm. there's a speed reserve conversation you can have, and and maybe he's just naturally fast, and that that is the case sometimes. That you know, they, some people are just naturally fast who are running these longer distances, mm -hmm. and they could drop down and run a quarter mile in probably forty six seconds just based mm -hmm. on you know their makeup. Now you have to start going in and looking at their training. Does their training reflect? that they're working on high intensity elements like shorter sprints and plyometrics and, mm -hmm. and maybe a weightlifting component. Um, and, and sometimes you see that and sometimes you don't. So it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult and, and, and I hate to say it, but you know, there's a lot of stuff going out there on out there with the, the pharmaceuticals that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Charlie Francis would say like, you know, okay, you take certain drugs, there can be, um, um, you know, transitional fiber can move to fast just by taking a drug. Mm. Um, mm. So that, that, that throws a wrench into everything and all the discussions, because certainly you want to look at the training and think that, okay, the training is the reason why they broke the world record. And, mm. but if there's things happening on a cellular level that you mm. don't even know about, um, like I think after, uh, somebody sent me something after the, the Norwegian guy broke the, uh, hurdle record, like just blew it apart, the mm -hmm. 400 hurdle record. And then there's another guy that, uh, won the 1500 and they said, Oh, look, the, you know, there's a, there's a new EPO that's out there that's undetectable and boosts the blood volume by 400%. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and, and it doesn't create any of the stickiness in the, in the blood that uh, created heart attacks, you know, 20 years ago. And you're like, oh, okay, that's great. But there was a medical purpose for that drug, whether yeah. it's anemia or uh, as a chemotherapy drug. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody's finding it and going, well, yeah, that would make this guy run faster. And we, we just don't know, like, that's not my area mm -hmm. of expertise, Yeah, nor do I want it to be. But at the same time, we can't just look at everything at face value and go, I'm just going to copy that guy's training program and, 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 and I'm going to succeed because you, 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 as well as I know that when you look at people's training programs, it's, it's, it's all over the map. Like this yeah, guy yeah, focuses yeah. on repeat 400s and this guy focuses on and repeat thirties or this guy lifts, just does heavy deadlifts. That's all he does. You're like, really? <laughs> so that <laughs> yeah, makes yeah. you faster. It hasn't made me faster, but yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if they just put it out there to distract you mm -hmm. and maybe they're doing something else, but it's, it's mm -hmm. so varied across the board that it's so hard to pinpoint you know having said that theoretically i think yes if i was working with distance runners up to marathon we would do some speed component two times a week with some plyos and work on that reactivity and mm -hmm. um, try to develop that speed reserve and i think from a resiliency point of view i mean it, it helps too yeah 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 there's something there's a couple of things like when you're talking about the pharmaceuticals um there's a big like I do a lot of, uh, you know, spend a lot of time reading pharmaceutical research, whether it's, you know, recently I was looking at some ARBs like angiotensin receptor blockers, um, tensinogen, um, and coming across papers of this could be the new performance yeah. enhancing drug, right? Um, or sildenafil, right? Like Viagra, some of these things that I'm mean, like, you know, you start to figure out the pathways and like how beneficial it would be. And it's like, God knows how many scientists are, 
are in some, you know, corner study room, like pulling out these papers, you know, whether it's in China and Russia, and like, they've been on this for 15 years, and we just have no idea, you know, because obviously, there's, there's a lot that doesn't get talked about. But it is interesting when you when you when you put that out there when you when you said that, because there's just a lot of stuff that we don't know. Now, something else you brought up there, which was, uh, you know, anaerobic speed reserve, I've had Paul Larson on. He was kind of one of the guys that he wasn't the guy that spearheaded that, but and also I hope to have Gareth Sanford on mm -hmm. at some point. But um, is that something you use for profiling um, some of the track athletes that you work with? Um, find it useful. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm always interested in what they're capable of at over shorter distances, and I think you know the one I was looking at when I had uh, sent something off to Sanford was um, you know looking at 400 meters versus 800 meter times. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, I think they found better correlations between 50 meter sprints and 800 meter times. Um, so, you know, it's, I think there's something there, uh, but again, there's variability within the different individuals. Some people might be more speed oriented and somebody mm -hmm. might be a little bit more, uh, sort of, uh, aerobic oriented when they run that race. And, and like we said before, we have these archetypes and it gives us a place to start. Yeah. And then we can reorganize once we're in the midst of training and, and adjust. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, 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 I looked at that research and I thought that was legitimate because mm -hmm. Charlie Francis was talking about speed reserve for like 40 years before these guys started talking about it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether or not anybody's going to give them credit for it. Um, but yeah, there's something there. I think so. Yeah. 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 And another thing I forgot that when you were talking about resiliency too, with, with the sprinting thing, like I, I forgot to touch on this, like that, that, that is a very highly specific type of resiliency that it's going to be really hard to find that in the weight room. Yes. Um, I just, I, I think in terms of sprinting and for example, yeah, we can try and with plyometrics, I'm always very very hesitant because it's a kind of a foreign i would consider it a foreign exercise a lot of the plyometrics that are you know what i mean out there as of now um whereas sprinting is fairly ingrained in the dna to some sport like regardless yeah. of who you are sprinting whether it's on grass or where whatever type of surface is fairly well tolerated um and you know it, it kind of self-limits itself like anyone can jump off a, a 24 inch box and try to hop um, and be have a load place on them that they're not ready to handle. But a lot of the times with sprinting, I find there's this natural limiter, you yes. know what I mean? That kind of limits people already. And yes, if the, some, someone's a power lifter and you know, the anterior power and the hamstrings and along with it, you can find problems with sprinting, but I think it's a more appropriate stressor sometimes for resiliency than people give it credit for. Right. Um, there's nothing that really mimics sprinting. Um, but yeah, back to the, um, yeah, the ASR. So not with the ASR, but what are some of the things that you do when you have someone come in to say, Hey, I want to go faster. Um, let's just take a, a, a hundred meter, 200 meter guy. What are the, some of the things that you do to, you know, profile and kind of organize how you're going to approach this athlete? Um, obviously, you know, watching them move is a big part of that, but what are some of the steps that you take, um, to try and figure out how you're going to approach this individual? I think, uh, some people will take the approach of like, let's find out what's wrong with you or what you've been doing wrong. And let's fix that. Whereas I think you always have to look and see what they've been doing that might be good and mm -hmm. it might be contributing. And then you not necessarily want to do more of that, but you certainly want to preserve that because they probably have some intuitive sense that that worked and they like it and you don't mm -hmm. want to take away stuff that they like. Right. And you yeah. want to give them more of what they like. So I, I'm very, um, you know, uh, keen about understanding what has worked in the past. And obviously you're doing a history and saying, okay, what injuries have he had? And, and um, what type of weight training? And I think the history is important so that you understand in your head how you can change things, but you don't want to change anything too drastically. And that's one thing I learned from Charlie Francis was, 
you know, for the most part, you know, they, you know, if, if we use an example of like Marion Jones, like she was doing something pretty successfully there. And so when he, we were looking at her, um, he kind of continued what the previous coach was doing for a period so that he could observe her doing things that, you know, she was used to rather than tearing her down and saying, we're going to do everything different. And, and this is my approach and putting his stamp on it. So that, I think that stuck with me mm-hmm. is that you have to be very, very respectful of maybe what they're coming in with and what they've had success with and try to reproduce that. And then, you know, have some nuances that you can gradually progress and integrate your style and your, your methods. Um, so that's, that's a huge one for me is, you know, understanding where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that may not sound sexy, like, you know, I'm going to run them through the screen and I'm going to pick this out, but yeah, you know, do a run. I want to see them warm up. I want to see what kind of time they take and, and how deliberate they are with their warm up. Um, and, and are they wasting their time? Are they doing unnecessary things? Um, but I, I think that's, that's part of my evaluation. Um, and, but I, I'm certainly not changing a lot of things. It might be just, I might put something in their head and say, why don't you try this? Focus on whatever your hand position or, uh, and then just see how it takes. But it, I would say my, my process is a lot more protracted than maybe Mm -hmm. some people's would be and you have Mm -hmm. to evaluate people over time and then start gradually shifting them at least that's what's worked for me that's very useful um so yeah it's you brought up warm up there that's not something i hear a lot of coaches talk about like i watch them specifically how i warm up and uh you know i spent a long time doing jujitsu um and that's one inherent thing that drove me insane was watching these god awful 30 minute long warm ups you know so we could go and watch technique for another 20 minutes and cool down and not warm ups that were actually applicable like oh we're going to we're going to run down the mat and do hops and it's like even though we're going to be on our knees for 40 minutes you know what i mean um yeah and just watching the complete lack of intent that was behind anything that those people were doing you know every class you just come in turn off your brain and move around it's like there couldn't be a bigger waste of time especially when people are paying for a class to come here and you know learn and get better than just mindlessly moving around because someone said that you know this guy did it 50 years ago at a jiu-jitsu club so we're going to do the same thing but yeah. that's something that I never really heard someone say out loud is watching how people warm up as a part of the process. And I think that's a very key, you know, you're preparing to literally create massive outputs um, and how you approach that and getting ready for that is a big thing, I think. Yeah. And then we, we've, I've had people come in and do like, uh, we're doing like 40 yard dash prep for combine. And I said, okay, you know, you guys, I haven't worked with you. I want you to see you guys warm up and the first 20 minutes was foam rolling and it's like really we're almost ready right and then they might do a few drills and like you know and, and like you said if this is where you start with your warm-up and we're going to sprint here i want to see some sort of like <laughs> yeah, connection yeah. to that yeah. you know as you build and that was not happening in, mm-hmm. in most cases so now the workout gets being taken up by you know me gradually progressing them and it wastes time in our workout because they're warming up in the workout now Mm -hmm. you know because i have to be careful with the progressions because i clearly saw that they didn't warm up properly and so Mm -hmm. what am i going to do get them going 100 percent right away no i gotta take my time so Mm. yeah it's it's interesting it is it is very interesting um something else i wanted to uh you know, talk about is like this concept of, you know, everyone's anyone that's been into sprinting has heard that, you know, it's not how fast you contract, it's about how fast you relax and reciprocal inhibition, which was, you know, brought forth popularly by Metviev, um, you know, from from the Russians. Um, there's been very little research around this. I've scoured it. I scour the research every six months for anything on reciprocal inhibition, relaxing the muscle. Um, 
what 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 was your what is your thoughts on this like i mean it's always the you know point of coaching i've and i've heard some people actually talk about some useful things like randy hunting randy huntington that um you know has come out there with some stuff recently and been talking about like yeah you know with the arms and stuff like this but um you know what is it what are what are the qualities that you think make the sprinter is it this reciprocal inhibition or is it accumulate because that's what we always hear right yeah what yeah, is yeah. it what is what is it what is your view on like the important qualities that are the things that you're trying to pull the trigger on like where did that i'm sure you know it's it's different than some of the stuff that you know gets put out there yeah it's interesting i'm reading a book right now and it's a book on percy williams who won the 1928 and 200 at the olympics he's was a vancouver athlete mm-hmm. and so this is 100 years ago mm-hmm. and so i'm reading this book and a lot of it makes sense like the coach he had would would uh you know focus on things that you know maybe charlie francis told me so like out of the starting blocks you focus on your arm drive right mm-hmm. because it's too difficult for you to tell your legs exactly what you want them to do so it's easier with your arms it's a little more tangible and then your legs Mm -hmm. will follow so that's a lot of stuff charlie talked about and then you know this guy would spend time massaging percy williams legs when that was never done and the whole point was to you know loosen them up and bring down muscle tone and and, um you know create that relaxation Mm -hmm. um so that he didn't have to think about it so Mm -hmm. i think that's that's probably what I'm focusing on more mm. is like, how do you get them to self-manage in a way that doesn't make them think about it? Mm-hmm. And as soon as you mm-hmm. say like the better sprinters turn off their muscles, well, then you're going to have a whole group of athletes who are like, how do I turn my muscles off faster? <laughs> yeah. Right? Like yeah. it doesn't make sense. Well, that's a like, problem. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, so unless, unless you have some, you know, conductivity test or you have these, you know, the, this company Strive sent me their EMG shorts. Like they have all the mm-hmm. EMGs and the Velcro yeah. or in the the spandex shorts. And I put them on, and I'm running on the treadmill, and, <laughs> and all you see is this thing's flashing. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. What am I gonna? Okay, so my hip flexors. It looked like everything was on all the time, and it's just so fat. I couldn't make anything out of it, and I assume what they were trying to figure out was like asymmetries. But then we all have asymmetries and what's a big asymmetry and what's a critical asymmetry. I don't know, Mm -hmm. but I just found that even at that level, looking at that stuff, I I could not process really useful. Mm. Right. And, And so I think that's why you have to, you have to focus on people manage themselves on their own and, and, and it'll come to fruition and, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I can't really yeah. answer no. that effectively. Like, because, you know, you, you know, you put somebody in front of you, you find out what their strength, you want to try to get them to be able to manage and regulate these things on their own mm. without you being involved. And yeah. because as soon as you are, you know, saying, do this, do this, do this, then they either freeze up or they just, but if somebody is, you know, you know, I watch it with my son and, you know, he's had some good races where he's run some people down because we just talked about, you know, what we basically, this whole theme of this, the conversation is just focus on the most simple thing, your rhythm, Mm -hmm. right. And just, let's just work the rhythm, work the rhythm. If you think push or pull, or it's going to be too much, right. Mm -hmm. But at least Mm -hmm. that rhythm is that it's, it's sort of this internal metronome that you can keep working and, uh, you're not going to have a mental breakdown because somebody's, you know, coming up on you and you think, well, I got to push harder. As soon as you say that, that's mm. what Charlie always said to me. Like, as soon as somebody pushes, it ruins that ace, that cyclical nature of the run. And mm. then the hips drop and then you're screwed once you lose that. So I, that's the one thing I've always thought about when coaching my kids is like rhythm, just keep that rhythm, just be mm. consistent. It'll work itself out. Um, but there's nothing you can do beyond that. Yeah. And maybe that rhythm is that relaxation piece, right? If you get yeah. them into that cyclical mindset, it'll naturally happen, right? Yeah. You know, like it does for the cheetah chasing the antelope or vice versa. Yeah. Rhythm is a, it's funny that you say that because, you know, I don't know if I want to say this. Yeah, I'll say it, whatever. Um, like 
my secret that I held fairly, and it took me a long time to understand was whenever I was fighting was this concept of rhythm. And I figured it out because trying to understand what is a good jab, you know, why can someone catch someone with a jab that looks different? You know, there's no, you know, Oh, all these people with good jabs have the same jab. It wasn't that it was had nothing to do with the physical appearance of the jab. What was it? Okay. It was timing. Well, what is timing? Well, all these fighters have these different rhythms, right? They all have these kind of set rhythms and they're expecting they're chunking data, right? You can't just like a fastball, you can't physically, you know, watch the fastball come. You're chunking data. You're yeah. just seeing the parts of the, the pitch. So then I kind of broke it down further. I was like, okay, so it's just breaking this rhythm. And if I just focus on breaking the rhythm, that's the key. And, you know, then I started finding success with this and I realized, oh yeah, it's not, I stopped caring about combinations. I stopped throwing, you know what I mean? I just found a way to break the rhythm and whatever was open was open. And I realized, oh, this is what it is. It's just banking. Oh, this is what he did here. And then I'm going to break that rhythm next time I see it come around or maybe put it in the pocket for later. Um, yeah. And even but, in the yeah. books I read about Bruce Lee, that's what he was always talking about, right? Yes. It's the Finding rhythm. To, yeah. Yeah. Rhythm. Uh, disrupt. You're trying to disrupt them. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you talk about with this, you know, relaxation thing, I think there, yeah, there is a cue and, I hear this with gate all the time and it drives me insane. I said this with a Darian is like, Oh, you can't improve, you know, running economy through, you know, changes in biomechanics and like any research I've read on that is very, very like it's, it's, it's not enough to say that. I don't know how people are saying that. Um, you know, when you look at the interventions that they're actually making with the athlete, it's like, I don't know how you can take that and say what you're saying. Yeah. Um, like it'd be like saying that you can't make someone faster inherently, like it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but what you said there was just taking this global perspective of trying to like, whether it's reduce muscle tone through managing the body through physical therapies yeah. or cueing, it's like, it makes so much sense to me. Cause if you're trying to affect this thing downstream, you're generally not going to affect it by jumping right at the problem. Right. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's almost like you have to have this out of body experience, but, but, but as soon as you say, like, relax your muscle, to me, that's an acyclical quality. It's like mm. one moment in time. Whereas if I say, keep your rhythm, then now it retains a cyclical quality mm -hmm. and it will self-regulate the relaxation yeah. because it, it has to, right. I'm sure we're hardwired to do that. Yeah. Um, some better than others, but you know, yeah. it's, it's, you know, we're, we're essentially animals. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, like I, we just got a new dog, <laughs> a puppy <laughs> and it's, it's a Vizsla. Apparently it can run 45 miles per hour. And I watch oh, him fast. run. He's eight weeks old and he runs, he's yeah. fast. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, who, who coached him? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, he's hardwired. And so it's just oh, yeah. tapping into that. Yeah. Yeah, those dogs are high drive too. Like they're they're oh yeah, yeah they're no at, they're athletes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No I know that side of things. Um, let's uh, one of the last things I kind of want to talk about is um, you know, how do you? Where I just want to kind of get an idea of some of the discussions that you you have with athletes. Like, how do you manage? dealing with uncertainty with an athlete, like when someone's coming to you, you know, for help, that's a very vulnerable place to be. Um, you know, how do you walk the line with them of being like, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to make you better, but we're going to try some things and we might fail. Like, how do you approach that? Cause I think that's a very hard line to walk with someone. Um, because if you go too far on one side, the athlete thinks like this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? Yeah. Um, just like you kind of talked about Charlie Francis, he could speak very scientifically, but also easy for someone to understand. How do you deal with that kind of line with an athlete of being like, Hey, I, I don't know. Um, but we're, we're going to get you there kind of thing. We're going to try and get you there. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, on some cases you have to be transparent, right? Because there's, there has to be some sort of trust built. Mm -hmm. um, 
but in in other cases you know that if you're totally honest that it could disrupt them that it could you know make them fall deeper into a hole mm. so i think you're you're trying to assess that on the on, as you're talking to them and looking at their body language and going okay well which approach am i going to go with right mm. um but most of the in most cases i'm pretty transparent mm. um and then i say okay we're going to try a few things and as as we go through this process we'll 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 understand you better and we'll understand where we have to go with it and you just have to be mm. patient again there's that word again but I think you do have to hold their hand and you do have to say, we're going to try this. And I would say most of the time it does work out mm. um, because uh, that's the approach we're taking. And, you know, there's the thing that seems to be lacking nowadays is a sense of appropriate progression with athletes. Mm. Um, and I think if you know exactly how fast or slow to progress them, um, you'll have much more luck right you know that mm -hmm. like we said we know that you have to get to point b starting mm -hmm. from point a now what does that path look like what is the steepness of that curve and i'm always mm -hmm. very careful about that and sometimes the curve is flatter and sometimes it's more vertical right mm -hmm. and and that can change you know some days it's going to be vertical some days it's going to be flat and as long as you're transparent about that because I, I i find that in rehab a lot you know, we'll make huge gains in two days and then they'll plateau or they make, oh, my joint swelled up. Okay, well, that's going to happen. But it, we made two steps forward. Maybe that's one step back. And as long as you're making that, you know, progress over time and, you know, you're not looking at your Bitcoin account every day, that's going to drive you nuts, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you have a general trend in the right direction. I think that's that's what you're trying to communicate. Um, and um you know, it's again, it's it's relationship building. All of it, you can't, you can't, you can't science them, over science them. Mm -hmm. um, you and you can't bullshit them too much, because um, you'll be found out, uh, and you'll be tuned out. So I think, you know, it, it, again, it's a really fine line that you're walking between uh, building them up and being realistic. So, but but also, you you know, one thing Charlie always said to me is like, give them attainable goals right and then you can just keep building on success after success after success even if they're really minor but you know you say okay this is our goal they attain it you're like great awesome let's go on to the next one but mm -hmm. they don't have to be huge jumps um mm -hmm. but but you do you know acknowledge that like that again i'll go back to my dog we're watching this master class on dog training mm -hmm. and one thing that you see the most is positive reinforcement with oh, yeah. dog treats yeah right yeah. if he does something right you jump in there and you give him a dog treat right and it works yeah right so why wouldn't it work for us for humans yeah, yeah. right rather than you know smacking them with a newspaper right so <laughs> yeah positive reinforcement is a uh you know Pavlov's and, and Maslow's hierarchy, like all those things with yeah. dog training are very, very applicable to, to, um, to athletes. Um, that's a good point. Dr. Um, one thing, one last thing here, I want to kind of get your, your perspective on is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And it's funny because I had a talk with a Darian the other day, um, a Darian bar and, you know, we, <laughs> we you got me all hyped up and we're just like yeah you know weight training you know this and that we're talking about sprinting and and going fast and timing and stuff like this and um but something i've i've spent a lot of time thinking about like how do you assess when it's appropriate for a developing athlete to incorporate strength because i know with you know some of the just like you were talking about with charlie francis and you know ground contact time shorten those up she didn't have the strength yet but he's being patient with younger athletes, um, you could just pick everyone out of the bucket and say, hey, you lack strength. Yeah. We're yeah. hitting the weights. Um, yeah. But I, someone that started lifting weights young, I was like nine when I started lifting weights. I know there's a cost to, you know, grinding through reps, right? With coordination yeah. there. Yeah. You're building some capacities and you're building tissue capacities and capabilities that are great in one way for resiliency in some ways, but you can create and balance anyways um yeah how how do you see that with younger athletes like how do you approach that when do you start kind of introducing is it a certain type of you know snc that you kind of like the softer calisthenic side with med balls or 
what is it that you kind of intervene with, with these developing athletes, whether it's in junior high, high school, um, how do you do that? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I take the approach that you kind of opened with was, you know, if I'm using sprint drills and sprinting and acceleration and maybe like hill sprints and you continue to improve, let's just keep going with that. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people want to, you know, jump into weight training because they think they're getting another advantage, but I, I'm, we're still improving. And I almost like to keep that on the top shelf for now mm. so that we can tap into it when we do start to plateau with just you know the the sprinting and it's not providing enough stimulus and then you can start adding you know obviously we're doing some jumps mm -hmm. um and med balls for fitness but i think you're there's a time and place for that like even my son we sprinted mostly and then when we had this volume of sprinting when he started mm -hmm. lifting weights the adaptive ability for him to improve in weights like just went sky high like he you know when he was 16 years old i think he 16 yeah 16 to 17 he's like he can bench press 225 eight times Jeez. um and we didn't lift a lot yeah, yeah. so i'm thinking why would why would we you know if that's just coming let it come and then yeah. when he gets to university he can lift a little more and he'll get some more qualities out of that mm -hmm. um but you know, we're doing okay. You know, we don't have, I mean, I guess it's, you know, kind of like a business example to some degree, like, Hey, we're doing well with what we're doing. And then the next phase, you know, we can talk to the investors and we can add this, but we're not trying to grow too fast. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I think that's what I'm always thinking of. I don't want to throw too much at them if we're still improving. Yeah, and I think that, yeah. that's that again, patience, right? Like, mm -hmm. let's be patient with this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that was very enlightening. Um, yeah. I don't think I've heard too many people come from it from that point of view. You know, there's just like this urgency of, Oh, get as much as we can while we can, you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 There's a lot of that. Well, you know, this is, this has been a great conversation. Um, you know, I'm going to ask you one last question at my, you know, I ask final questions to, to every guest, but there's one I'm interested in. Um, especially guys like yourself that have been around for, you know, quite some time. Um, what was a, uh, incorrect hypothesis or, or, um, you know, perspective that may have been, um, off slightly that you've learned a great deal from, like whether it was a bias that preceded that, or whether it was experience that you had that kind of put you down a path of thinking, Oh, this was useless, or maybe this had value. Um, or maybe it was just, you know, a train of, of, of thinking or concepts that, um, you know, kind of led you and what, what did you learn from that? You know, what did you, what did you take away from, uh, you know, that experience or, or. Yeah, I think one, the one thing that I've learned, and again, you know, it's harder when you get older because you need recovery, but I think there's been an overemphasis on, you know, um, you know, like we need to rest more and we need, um, uh, what's the word uh, the management the game management or load management yeah yeah, right? yeah so everybody's yeah. like these load management oh we need to yeah. rest more and then but i'm you know again if we go back to that the body adapting and stimulus mm -hmm. infusions and all that we need to have a certain critical load to mm -hmm. one operate efficiently and 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 be be successful um, but also to be healthy, right? So you need to work to be healthy. And I think that's a lost quality right now is people want to work less and get the same results and get the mm. same benefits. And, you know, injury, you know, since load management has been implemented, we still have 62 ACL injuries uh, in the NFL. You know, mm. uh, we still have hamstrings in baseball and basketball when, you know, I don't remember hamstrings pulling in basketball in the eighties and nineties, you know, I don't know if Michael Jordan ever pulled a hamstring. So yeah. something is wrong. Yeah, We're missing yeah, yeah. something. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, and, and I fell into that trap too, a bit where you think, Oh, we need to recover more and we need, you know, and then uh, you just detrain. So, mm -hmm. um, but knowing what that magic number is, is, is obviously difficult. Um, and, you know, I would love to say that, you know, uh, Omega Wave and HRV and all these things are helping, but sometimes they muddy the waters a bit too. And you, it's uh, so hard complex. to tell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. You don't know what signals you're reading. So, um, so I think that's what I'm thinking about now is, okay, we have to have a, a certain volume of work 
in sprinting and speed work uh, every week for us to be in within striking distance of their best um you know you can't just rest yourself into better shape so that's where i'm at that that was great that was a great uh that was a great piece um so i know people can find you uh on instagram and, and you you're on derek hansen at, on instagram right yeah, derek m hansen derek yeah. matthew hansen okay. um derek m hansen and i have one for at uh, running mechanics and the two websites are runningmechanics.com and sprintcoach.com where i yeah. provide courses and consults and all that so yeah and one of the famous uh you know with pat davidson's news that was a lot of the inspiration for pat stuff because we talked i talked to pat with his athletic weapon i know he was saying like you know you were a big uh inspiration for that portion of combining his his training for that so that's yeah so folks you can you can find derek at those spots and and i hope you you took as much uh, out of this conversation as i did and uh, we'll catch you later <laughs>